Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we've got a story of compliance that allowed somebody to graduate from a university. But first let's take a step down to community college with a story from Fred Sam 25 My community college credits don't count? Okay, sign me up for all your classes, professor. I went to a pretty bad high school. They had very few AP classes. So my parents signed me up for local community college classes for physics that I attended after school. Fast forward to my first year at university and I go to apply my community college physics credits to get out of taking redundant classes. University requires me to take physics 4A, 4B, and 4C, each being a prerequisite for the next. It was like classical physics, electromagnetism, and quantum physics or something like that. Since I'd taken all three in community college, I'd be a year and a half ahead. The first problem I ran into was the registrar's office wouldn't automatically apply the community college credits to cancel out the required credits for graduation. I had to get the professor that taught the course to sign off on it, and for that semester, the same professor taught all three classes. I meet with the professor, and he refuses to sign the forms. Community college is a joke, especially yours. You need to take 4A, 4B, and 4C here if you want to graduate from this university. Feeling defeated, I went to register for 4A, but then I noticed something. While the online system wouldn't apply my community college credits to eliminate the required physics credits, it did apply the community college courses for the required prerequisites so I could register for 4A, 4B, and 4C all in the same semester with the same professor. In fact, because it was the same professor, none of the course times conflicted. He arranged all three to be in the same classroom back to back. No need to run around campus either. First day of class, I sit front row for 4A. Don't know if the professor noticed me then, but once class ended and everyone else got up, I stayed in my seat waiting for the next one to start in 10 minutes. He glanced at me funny as he went through 4B. When that ended, and I didn't get up, he approached me. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to leave. I have another class soon. No worries, I know. 4C. I'm enrolled in that too. You can't be enrolled in all of them. They have prerequisites. He checks his enrollment sheet, and sure enough, I'm enrolled in all three. He tries to convince me that I'll fail if I stay, but I tell him not to worry. I'm not gonna lie. It was tough sitting through three hours of classes, three hours of midterms, and six hours of finals, but I'd already taken all of these courses. In the end, I got an A, B+, and A-, minus. but best of all, I got to knock that jerk down a notch. If you had to go through what OP went through, would you be able to sit there for three straight classes in a row? Or would that drive you absolutely crazy having to put up with that? Let me know how you would handle it in the comments down below. That said, our next story is from Crime Doc 14 Compliance with the letter of the university rules to get out of a graduation requirement. This is a story my father-in-law told me about his time in college. I'm not sure if it's actually malicious, but thought maybe it would fit here. So when Pop was an undergrad, his university required students to take four semesters of a foreign language. This would have been the late 1940s, by the way. Pop was not great at learning languages, but managed to get through the first two semesters. But French 3 was too much for him, and he failed the class. Pop didn't want to have to retake it, so, foreshadowing his future career as a lawyer, he read through the graduation requirements carefully, and then registered for French 4. First day of term, he walks into the class, which was taught by the same professor who taught French 3. The professor looks at him and says, Mr. Pop, what are you doing here? I thought I gave you a failing grade last term in French 3. You did, sir, Pop replies politely. Then why are you in French 4? asks the professor, sounding rather annoyed. Well, sir, Pop says respectfully. The requirement says I have to take four semesters of a foreign language. It says nothing about passing the classes. The professor glares at him and then sighs and says, Mr. Pop, if I give you a D in this class, will you go away and never come back to my class? Absolutely, sir, Pop says happily, and cheerfully leaves the classroom, never to return. The following year, the university catalog stated that students must take and pass four semesters of a foreign language. Pop was terrific and gave the best hugs. Honestly, I didn't have in-laws, I just had another set of wonderful parents. Miss you guys. See, this is one of those people that you see these rules where it says you must take and pass a class. 
Who was the person that got away with it to the point that they had to add that phrasing? OP's father-in-law and that crop of students were probably the ones that made them introduce all those rules that have lasted for decades now, generations. Our next story is by Taipan821. Why did you schedule this call on my off hours? Been reading other stories of virtual meeting shenanigans? Thought I'll add my own. Day off, attending a hazard reduction burn, so out in the bush with a fire truck, suited up and running around like a happy pyromaniac. I get a phone call from work. I answer and get told that I must be present for a virtual meeting scheduled for 10 minutes time for a training on a system I already know as I'd been using it for the past 6 months at a venue. I remind them that it's my day off and my manager speaks with a tone of, do it or you're fired. Alrighty then. First strike, managers late to their own meeting. The meeting eventually starts and I've connected by my phone and Bluetooth earphones. My camera and mic are off because of the noise. The other firefighters are having a chuckle at my expense. Then my manager insists I turn my camera and mic on, otherwise they'll mark me as absent. Alrighty then. I stand in a spot where the fire will roar up behind me, somewhat safely, and turn my phone, camera, and mic on. The rest of the firefighters go nuts with the radio chatter, as the people in the virtual meeting see yours truly, masked up, full ensemble with the noise of fire roaring up behind him, the sound of the pump and the panicking radio chatter. I then end the call. Manager then begins to frantically ring, as she thinks she's just seen one of her better team members go up in flames. They never schedule training on my days off after that, jump ship to a competitor two months later. If you want to know how to get one of your better workers to quit, just call them up on their day off and tell them to do something or they're basically fired. That'll make them really happy and enthusiastic about their job and sure to stick around. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Each video has great stories, like our final story of the day by Disastrous Glove 4889 Not allowed to use my initiative? Work is cancelled then. This happened a few years back, but I got reminded of the guy involved again recently, and it all came flooding back. I had been given a new project at work, which was to install a new type of LED bulb and train signals in place of the old halogen ones. The guy I was doing the project with, we will call P, short for Richard, this guy was universally hated. I had never heard of him before, but I asked what he was like, and the first words out of the mouths of anybody who had any dealings with him were, he's a jerk, or other more C-based words. Honestly, I've never known somebody to not have one person like them at any level of the company. Also, he had no actual authority over me. It was his project and I was the person actually performing and supervising the work. But anything I did under his say-so was done with mere courtesy. If anything, I was a great above him job-wise. However, my boss told me to play nice because I was new to the supervisor role. I got given a spreadsheet of all the signals that needed the bulbs changed and worked out the staff, the materials, and the best course of action to do the work. It was a crap job. You had to change brackets, lamp holders, wiring, and nuts and bolts with tools that weren't fit for the purpose. Usually in the wind or rain and up a 20 foot ladder around live electrical equipment. You could isolate some circuits, but usually not all of them in a signal head. Also, I was consistently the last person at work, including my boss's bosses, dealing with all this crap for no extra thanks, and no chance of extra pay either, salaried worker. After doing the job for a while, I got an email from P saying that he'd planned which signals to change for each shift from now on, and I was not allowed to stray from the plan. The plan was freaking dumb. Instead of doing signals in a straight line, it was two in this area, two at this area five miles away, three here, just terribly put together. I told them this was stupid as heck, and we needed to do them all in a line, and for maybe the first time in his life, he saw sense and relented. He then made a new plan with them all in a row, which he said I had to follow. What he failed to realize because he was incompetent was the railway has engineering works in specified areas where other works cannot take place in them for safety reasons. 
The very next shift, what he has listed us to do cannot be done. We cannot access the area. If we did, we would get very much fired. So I looked at the spreadsheet, found an area we could work, and worked there. This infuriated P, and I was told via email to follow his plan to the letter and to stop being so arrogant. Completing a night's work instead of literally doing nothing was arrogant? Okay, fine. Malicious compliance activated. The next couple of nights went okay, but then another specified area showed up we couldn't work in. This time we just didn't do the work, and I reported back as such because we can't deviate from the plan. This happened multiple times a week. Radio silence from P. At some point, P's boss comes out with us to see our work because she hasn't seen this type of work before, and we get along great honestly. This was planned in advance. She wasn't keeping an eye on us because we'd started to underperform. We get about half of the work done and then start packing up to leave. She asks why. I tell her because the next signals are in an area for planned engineering works and we can't go in there. She's okay with that. As I said, if we went in there, we would probably be out of a job. Or we could be killed, trains moving, high voltage equipment left on, etc. But she then asks why we can't go to another location and work there. I show her the plan and tell her how we're supposed to adhere to it at all costs. She asks why, and I ask her if she's seen P's email. She hadn't, but said we should chase it up during the day. I get a very prickly email from P during the day asking why I only completed half the work. And he'd even checked to see what time I'd been on track till to tell me that I still had two hours I could have worked. He cc'd his boss and my boss into the email. He thought he had me because he was correct. There were two hours left before we had to get off track in the section we completed the work. But the cancelled engineering hours in the area for all the other assets made the rest of the work impossible. I was slightly taken aback by this though because while there is a way to check what time people get off track, nobody ever uses it because it's such an underhanded thing to do and creates massive distrust with everybody. He's the only person in nearly 20 years at this company I've known to have done it. His manager then called us all into a meeting before anybody else could speak. She told P the reason half the work was done was because the equipment further along in his plan was in a specified area we are not permitted to work in regardless of what his stupid hindrance of a plan says. She said he should have looked at what areas we could work at before a shift instead of spending that time spying on the staff for what time they get off track. Her numbers had me working at 40% above what was expected for the shift when I was in charge and less than half of what I should be doing when he was making us follow his plan. B tries to talk back, but she says, and I quote, shut your stupid mouth before you say anything else useless. I love this woman. I then get sent out while she talks to P and my boss in private. The fallout was the project getting taken off of P, him being moved on from that role to never have a position with any other kind of authority again, She gave my staff and I a much better project to work on with more overtime, voluntary, a better person to liaise with, and the mental image of P looking like a scolded puppy. You gotta love that this person tried to take over this entire project and was doing so badly that multiple times they tried to direct these people under strict orders that they were not to deviate from the plan at all into areas that probably could have killed them if they were dumb enough to actually go through with it. In fact, P shouldn't have been moved when they realized that P tried to send these people into dangerous areas multiple times. They should have been fired and ejected from that company. Imagine they actually did go there because of his strict orders to not do any other plan and something happens and the entire company is under liability because somebody died doing their job. Like maybe that's justification enough to just fire that person for not doing a very good job. But hey, what do I know? I'm just a person that reads Reddit stories. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. 
Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.